everyone. Um, it's just great to be with you all as I'm adjusting to this new way of speaking. Um, and just good to be with you all. So nice after um, a summer of, well, I went on holiday first of all, didn't I? I went on holiday for two Sundays and then came back. And the very next day after I came back, I went in for a uh, a total hip replacement five weeks ago, and uh, and so many people um, are just so grateful to be part of a church family where so many people were saying to me, hope it goes well, Dave, hope it goes well. I have to confess, I didn't expect it to be as big an operation as it was. I, I was saying to everyone, don't worry about me, it's like having a fill-in done, like going to the dentist, it's a bit like a fill-in, I'm in pain now, I'll have I understand now why so many of you were praying for me that I wouldn't have to have the operation. Um, and, and, you know, you were saying, hope it goes well, and I had no, didn't think anything other than it would go well. And it was only afterwards, after I'd had the operation, and I'd got a bit of time on my hand sitting at home recovering, that I actually had time to sort of Google the stats for how many people die <laughs> when they have a total hip operation. I'm so glad I only Googled it after the operation. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 but, you know, at least because I Googled that, I was even more grateful to God uh, as a result of that uh, uh, and looking at the stats. But also, I just want to say to all of you, I have been... I've really felt you praying for me and praying for a speedy recovery. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's not yet six weeks, it's five weeks and a bit. But, but just believe God's hand has been just so, so grateful for belonging to a church family uh, where so many people don't just say hope it goes well, but they, they pray for you uh, and pray for blessing on you. And um, I've not just had a, a new hip, I started last Monday, as uh, 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 I joined a, a college uh, staff team based in Liverpool Cathedral uh, for two days a week, training, uh, don't worry, I'm not leaving you, this is just a part-time job, two days a week, just training Anglican vicars. And uh, those who knew I was starting on Monday kept saying to me, Dave, hope it goes well. Hope it goes well. And, uh, you know, again, I just want to say thank you for praying for me for that. It, it, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Because um, uh, I can say to you that both things went well. The Monday went well, the hip operation went well. And I'm and, and just so grateful to people who said to me, hope it goes well, praying it goes well. I wonder in your life right now, is there something you're facing that you would love someone to say to you today? Hope it goes well. Uh, maybe, like me, you're starting a new job. Maybe you've got an operation of some kind booked up or whatever. Maybe you've got exams you're facing already. Maybe you're moving house. Maybe for some of you, you're starting a new term in university. For some of you, I know you're changing location. Spoke to Juliana last week. Moved from Canada to England. What a massive change that is. We hope it goes well, Juliana. Uh, and, and, and Becky from Leicester and Rebecca from London, just met them today, just hope it goes well. Everybody say, hope it goes well. To stand up, you three, just three of you, stand up. We're going to embarrass you, yeah. Stand up, yeah, this is, this is welcome to so just Everyone say to them, hope it goes well. <laughs> yeah, we hope it goes well for you. Sit down, you haven't to be embarrassed all the time. But, but you know, whatever it is, uh, working out a relationship issue, hope it goes well. Uh, uh, holiday planning, life in general. When you love someone, when you love someone, you so want whatever is going on in their life to go well, don't you? You never want things to go badly for someone. You want it to go well. And um, why don't you just think of something that's going on in your life right now? And we're a family. Some of you are here for the first time. Welcome to the family. We're not a church meeting. We're, we're, we're not a church service. We're, we're a meeting of believers coming together. But why don't, we, why don't we think of something that we want to go well in our lives? And if, if you can't think of anything or it's too complicated, you know, just, just say life in general. And just tell the person in one short sentence, because I will stop you after a minute. But just, just in one short sentence, and if you don't know what to say, just say life in general. 
all right? But, but just say to somebody next to you, this is what I want to go well. And just tell them what it is. Come on. Just give you, just, just the person next to you, just tell them what it is. Okay. That'll do. Right? I knew this would happen. Shh. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, why don't you say to that person, either hope that goes well or praying that goes well. Just say it to one another. Hope it goes well. Praying it goes well. You see, say it again. Where's Yanni? Say it again. And this time, this time, I want you to say, because there's a Greek, a New Testament Greek word for this. All right, a word in the New Testament. It's a Greek word that means, really means, hope it goes well. And it's the word makarios. I, that, that, we're not going to go too much. I, it just means hope it goes well. Is that right, Yanni? By the way, when I went for my interview uh, for this new job, they said, do you know any New Testament? Do you know any Greek? And I said, I know a little Greek. <laughs> and I got the job. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. They didn't ask me that. They didn't ask me that. But I do know Yanni. Um, but anyway, anyway, Makarios is, is, so just say to the person next to you, say Makarios. Makarios. I just like the word. Say it again, Makarios. Makarios. It means, it's that word, when you look it up in the New Testament, it's that word that means blessed, blessed, makarios. It really means it'll go well. Things will go well. And, um, you know, isn't it wonderful when you can pray for one another by name? It's an expression of love that the family of God can experience. It's one of the massive bonuses of being in a Christian community that you pray for, that we can pray for one another. By name, not just bless, but we actually bring to mind. That's how we can pray a long time, because we can pray for one another and pray that things will go well. Uh, and we're going to see that praying for one another that things go really well is a really good prayer to pray. Uh, and we're so grateful when people pray for us, and we need to pray more and more for one another in these days no matter what's going on, even as it's a sort of a feel of a new year, although Ben, my son, who's an, a, an accountant, tells me, what's this about it being a new year? Some of us work all summer. Uh, but it, but, it, but it, it, for many of us, it feels like a new year. And, and we just pray it all goes well. You see, that word, makarios, it, 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 it is great. And, um, you know, this word blessed, you see, in, in, in fashion, it's quite in fashion, this word blessed. Um, you see it on Facebook, hashtag blessed, or a tweet, to me, hashtag blessed, I got a new job, hashtag blessed, I had a pay rise. You think, hang on, let's actually look into the word of God and see what that word means. So let's get straight into our passage, our Bible passage for this week, and probably next as well, and seeing this word, makarios, blessed, it'll go well with, seeing it being used by none other than Jesus, and the person of Jesus, God clothed in human flesh. This is God the Son showing us God the Father through the anointing of God the Holy Spirit. God starts using this word, blessed, makarios, it'll go will. Not saying everyone is blessed, but describing the sort of person who it goes well with. Describing the sort of person who can know the blessing of God in their life and that things go well with them. So we're going to find out what sort of person, what sort of character, what sort of character do you have to be the sort of person where Jesus says about you, it'll go well with you. Makarios. It'll, you'll be blessed. This is not reading our horoscope. This is discovering what sort of attitudes people have who are blessed by God. So turn to Matthew chapter 5 and... It should be on the screen as well. I'm going to just stroll through some crucial verses in the Bible. And let's hope that as I speak, we all listen to what God the Holy Spirit is saying to us as we do that. That it goes well, that we learn something we can put into practice as we look at this passage written by Matthew, recording the very words of Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, we say, come, even as we read your word, as we look into your word, we pray, open the eyes of our heart, open the ears of our, 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 our spiritual understanding, we pray, that we might hear you speaking to us this morning, we pray. 
Amen. So Matthew chapter 5, and let's look at the setting to this before we begin looking at it. And Matthew chapter 5, it's, um, it, it comes after, believe it or not, the, the chapter 4. And, and at the end of chapter 4, we read how Jesus has been preaching, going around, preaching the kingdom of God and healing the sick, and great crowds are following him. All right, so Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Jesus says that Matthew writes, seeing the crowds. There's quite a crowd here this morning. Jesus saw crowds and thought, it's time to teach. We read in other parts of the New Testament that Jesus had compassion and wanted to heal them. In this case, he sees a crowd of people and within him there's something that says, I want to teach this crowd. Uh, uh, but look at what happens next. Where does he go to teach? So we see in the crowd, Jesus went up on the mountain. This is interesting. Matthew points out that Jesus has gone up on a mountain. It could have been a steep hill. Luke, in actual fact, describing the same, the same incidents, the same times, describes it as a plain. As a, and it could have been a plain or a plateau. But, but Matthew, writing for a Jewish audience, really makes it clear to them, Jesus has gone up a mountain. And it might have been, a, a, as I say, a steep hill or going up onto the plateau. But Matthew wants to make this point. Jesus has gone up. Um, why is he doing this? Perhaps... He's reminding his readers about Moses who received the law. Where did he receive the law? Mount Sinai, up at the top of the mountain. Um, and Moses received the law, the then word of God, at the top of the mountain. And what we see here is that just as Moses had to go up the mountain before he brought the word of God. So Jesus goes up the mountain. He's bringing not just ordinary words, not just any words that any old rabbi, and there were lots of rabbis teaching at that time, but Jesus goes up because he's going to bring the words that go much beyond the top of the mountain. He's going to bring the words that are from heaven down to earth. Uh, and this has real implications for all of us who want to say, who've been saying to one another, I hope it goes well. I hope things go well. Uh, and, and we say it even to ourselves quite rightly. You see, another New Testament writer who wrote to, to, to Jewish believers was, was the writer to the Hebrews. And he makes it clear in chapter 3, the first six verses of Hebrews, he makes it clear that Jesus is much greater than Moses. And what, he said, what we need to understand is, come on, when Jesus goes up the mountain before he starts to speak, this is carrying the word of God that's got much more weight, much more authority than ever Moses brought. This is something that's coming from heaven down to earth. And today, we weren't there that day 2,000 years ago or so, but today, as we sit and as we listen and as we open our Bibles, so we too can receive this fresh Word came fresh oil. We can receive this fresh word of God coming from heaven into our hearts today. Uh, Jesus is greater than Moses. And he went up on the mountain. And then we read, the next thing we read is he sat down. Um, why sit down to teach? Back in the day at that time, this was the custom for top teachers. They would sit to teach. You see it in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus goes into the synagogue, he stands up. You can read it, it's recorded there for us. He stands up to read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah uh, and he reads the scroll and then he sits down to teach. Uh, and, and again, these details are here to help us understand the authority that's coming with these words. You see, elementary teachers, beginning teachers would stand to teach, but Jesus sat down to teach. By the way, I'm not claiming I'm a top teacher. It's because I had a hip replacement. Right? So just get that clear. Um, you see, the writer to the Hebrews again talks about Jesus sitting. And in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, he says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and he upholds the universe 
by the word of his power. And he goes on to say that after making purification for sins, in other words, after going to the cross and dying on the cross and being raised from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Do you, do you see something? He's seated, uh, and right now he's sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, and it's from there his living word comes to us. We have a teacher who sat down because he's a top teacher. There are implications to hearing the word that Jesus brings. There are implications. When you hear any old teacher bring something to you, it doesn't really matter what you do with it. When he speaks, there are implications to what he says. You see, the writer to the Hebrews again goes on in the next the start of the next chapter. After having said that Jesus has sat down, he says this in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore, because Jesus has sat down at the right hand on the majesty on high, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Are you getting this? When you open your Bible and you receive the living word of God, when you hear it preached and people bring to you the living word of God, pay close attention to it. This is a teacher who sat down at the right hand of majesty on high and his word is coming to you. So I want to challenge us. Uh, you know, some of us, we, 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 we get excited if we think someone brings us, some human prophet brings us a prophetic word. Wow, isn't that fantastic? But, but do you understand, even the words we're looking at today, it's not some human prophet. It's not some angelic being. If an angel came to you and began to speak, it's not as exciting as what Jesus says to you in this passage. Because his name is more excellent than the angels. His name is more wonderful than the name of any human prophet. When he speaks, we need to pay close attention lest we drift away. And I'm not at all knocking having angelic appearances or having human prophets speak. Not at all. What I am saying is let's pay close attention to the living word of God that comes through the written word of God. It's accessible. It's open to us all. We can still our hearts and receive something of God speaking to us. You know, I, I've just been praying so much for all of us in these last couple of weeks. And just praying, Lord God, cause us to be a people who are receptive to your word. Cause us to be a people who long for your word. Uh, you know, what a joy, what a privilege it is to read our Bibles. This is fantastic, uh, you know, that you can read your Bible and have the Word of God come to you. Sumbo encouraged us, was it Sumbo or, or Ify? I can't remember, but somebody encouraged us this morning about just being, you know, coming, what's our expectancy as we gather together that raise your expectations. Can I say, raise your expectations when we gather together on a Sunday as Central Church family here. But raise your expectation on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday when you open your Bible and you turn to some passage and you, maybe I, I just still my heart and I, I just begin to speak in tongues a little bit and, and just begin to pray to God and worship God before I start to read. And I just want God to speak to me and I tune my spirit in. Speaking in tongues isn't, is, let's not reduce it to the sign that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful gift, a gift of freedom that enables us to tune our hearts into God's heart. And that when we read whatever it is, we say, Holy Spirit, speak to me through your written word. It's so, so important we do that because pay close attention to what you've heard lest you drift. You see, we all know, sadly, if you've been a Christian for any number of years, you know some people who have drifted away from God, from the church community. You know, I find in my experience, I find most of the people I know that have drifted away, it's never been because of suddenly some gross sin that they went into. It's just been a drift. Drift, drift is the most dangerous thing in your Christian life. Uh, and I want to say to students where, you know, coming new into Manchester, 
but not just to them, to people who are, you know, 20, 30 years in the faith, to leadership team, to, to everybody. Let's keep, let's devote that time to having our mountaintop place where we go up the mountain, where we climb with Jesus, where we're co-climbers with him, that we go. We're not just in the crowds. It wasn't everybody that went up with him, but we have that mountaintop place. And we say, this is where I'm going to discover more of what God's saying to me. It's wonderful. On Tuesday, United School of Ministry, Manchester, USMM kicks off. And we've got 22 students lined up. Um, how many of them are from here? Just stand up if you're from Central and you, you started. Stand up. Go on, Sonia. Don't be shy. Nathan. There we go. Look. There's three of them from here. We're coming from nine different church communities. And Marissa as well. And, and Veronica at the back. And Sonia. And yeah, I think I've said it. Wrong. But, but how wonderful. They've, they've made a decision, as many of you have in the past. I'm giving a year of my life where Mondays and Tuesdays, I'm creating a space where I can have the word of God brought to me. That's wonderful, isn't it? Give them another round of applause, because I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, but I want to say to you, whatever you're doing, keep a mountain space in your life. I want to challenge you. If I ask you right now, where's your mountain? <laughs> where's the mountain that you hear God speaking to you? Uh, the danger without one is you can drift. Have that space, be it an armchair, be it that, that bedroom, you know, just... Just don't let yourself drift. Don't stop coming to church meetings. Don't stop reading your Bible. You know, don't say, I'm going to miss a Sunday this week. I'm just feeling a little bit tired. No, come on, don't drift. Keep coming. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying. Just keep going at it. You see, Matthew writes next, he says this, his disciples came to him. Not the crowds, his disciples, his climbing companions, and he opened his mouth. Pause. Just imagine being there with Jesus, a climbing companion, and he opens his mouth. Uh, wow, what would you be doing? You wouldn't be checking the football scores on your mobile phone. <laughs> You'd be thinking, wow, he's going to speak. You'd be hanging on his every word. Uh, and he opens his mouth, and then Matthew says he taught them. He opened his mouth, and he taught This was his longing, I want to teach these people. You know, you teach people, we prayed for all our teachers involved in education from our university professor uh, right through to, he sat behind the students as well, that's very good, yeah. from our university professor, right, you know, all the way through, people in teaching assistants, teachers, whatever, we prayed for everybody involved in education a couple of weeks ago. And, and the one thing, when you're involved in education, what you long for is people to receive your teaching. You don't want to control them. You don't want to manipulate them. But you want them to receive your teaching and to respond to it. Um, you see, Jesus taught and expected people to respond to his teaching. He wasn't just passing the time away when he taught. He expected people to respond. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't come with legalism. John 1.17 says he came full of grace and truth. But he expected his disciples to bear the fruit of of what he taught. And, and let's make it clear, you don't do good works to become a Christian. But when you, Jesus teaches you and you are a Christian, you do good works as a sign that he's your teacher and you're in his kingdom. You live differently, not to impress God, but because God has made an impression on you with the word that he brings upon you. And as you sit and listen, while he opens his mouth from the mountain, things began to happen. Kofo explained this so brilliantly a couple of Sundays ago, talking about grace, remember? Uh, about grace not being something that's forcing, but grace giving us the ability to live out the words of Jesus. That's what grace is about. Grace, let's get it clear, you know, um, we do things because grace enables us to do things. There's no such thing as workless grace. I can't find it in my Bible. You know, even later on in this passage, um, Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who, uh, as we have forgiven our debtors. And then he says, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you yours. 
You see, something happens when you receive the word of God. You, you're empowered as you open your heart. And even as we're singing, I give you my all. You receive the word of God and you can live it out. And this is what he says. So come on. He says, blessed, makarios, it'll go well with. So here we go. What sort of person is blessed? Who will it go well with? The rich, the powerful, those born into royalty? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a shock. The kingdom of heaven, the domain of his righteousness, peace and joy that we all want so much, it belongs to the broken. It's not when we feel as though we've got our act together that things go well with us. Jesus says it's when we're in our times of understanding our need that we can grow the most. How many of us, some of you nod in your head, put your hand up if you understand, that's true of me. I've grown the most when I've understood my need the most. Um, It goes well with me. Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase in that says, it goes well with me when I'm at the end of my rope, when I'm at the end of my tether, because that's when there's more of God and less of me. When you get to that place where I'm absolutely bankrupt, I'm critically in need of someone other than myself. I need God at this time. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. There's a word in Greek that's used there. Apparently there's two different words for poor, but this is the word that really means bankrupt. I'm absolutely desperate. I need you, God, in this situation. I need you. Um, Poor in spirit. Let me just say straight away, in case I don't think anyone would think this, but just some people do from time to time think poor in spirit. That means, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not really maturing as a Christian. That means I'm, I'm always sinning. Uh, therefore, the kingdom of heaven belongs to me. No, not at all. Uh, if I mean, you know, it isn't referring to those with a deficit of moral righteousness. You just look further down in verse 20 to see Jesus saying he expects the righteousness of his disciples to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees or else you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Those who are true disciples of Jesus don't just sin and say, well, the grace of God is there, he'll forgive me. No, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees because you have the enabling grace of God to live out what Jesus says. Um, So people who are poor in spirit are those who say, I'm not going to be deceived by the attraction of wealth. Uh, The kingdom really belongs to the powerless of the world, to those who embrace that condition. I'm not trusting in handouts from the powerful of this world. I'm trusting 100% in God for my deliverance. I'm totally trusting in it. It'll go well with you. It'll go well with you. Whatever need, whatever it is you said, whatever it is you thought earlier on, I want this to go. It'll go well with you when you say, I'm dependent upon him. My dependence is him. See, the opposite of being poor in spirit, is being filled with pride. Um, It can happen to us all. Uh, It's been quite humbling for me, really, walking around on crutches. Uh, I I went, um, as I said, on on Monday, you know, just this whole thing of having to sit on a low chair, it's gradually going, sit on a low chair, take some cushions, crutch, move in. I went on Monday for my first day at my new job. Uh, students, teachers, meeting them for the first time. I love, I thought it's important I make a good impression. See the pride? Uh, but in I went with a bag of cushions, a crutch, a bag, carrying, put it down, put the crutch down, put the, uh, and, and it, it was awful. At one moment, um, a 19-year-old student came to me and said, when we were moving from one room to another, a 19-year-old student girl came to me and she said, can I help you with your bag? I, I turned around and looked to her. I said, no. I said, I am perfectly, I can do this on my own. I probably didn't quite shout that loud, but that was the attitude. And straight away, I just felt God said, Dave, what's that all about? Uh, I, I, you know, suddenly I realized this pride in me. I don't want to accept help. And so just admit it, Dave, that pride-filled reaction is something you need to repent of. So I turned to the God and said, oh, but thanks, smiled. I said, But thanks so much for asking. I really do appreciate that. And I still carried my bag. But but, but I smiled at her. And I repented of the attitude of, I don't need your help. See, Jesus is teaching us here, it's the poor in spirit who find it goes well. Not the independent, not the pride-filled, not the self-centered. But those who admit, on my own, I haven't got what it takes. I'm needy. 
Uh, I'm made to be. I realize I'm created to be in union with God. Without God in my life, I'm totally bankrupt. Great news, because I'm sure many of us, we know such moments. Let's keep those moments in our lives. No matter how fine things seem to be going, no matter how well things seem to be going, let's not let pride come into our lives. Let's keep that dependence of God and say, God, I'm poor in spirit. I'm poor in spirit, and I know that I'm qualified then for receiving something from you. We're going to see what we do receive in the very next verse. Because Jesus says next, he says, Blessed are Makarios, it'll go well with those who mourn for they will be comforted. Again, not what you'd expect. Isaiah prophesied, didn't he, in Isaiah 40? Comfort, an end time comfort, an eschatological comfort, an end time comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Uh, So what's this mourning about? What's this comfort about? Is it the comfort, you know, Jairus dies, Jesus goes to, um, Jairus' daughter dies, Jesus goes to visit him and raises her from the, is it that sort of comfort? Could be, and it's part of it. But I think, The poor in spirit know what it is to mourn more than just over family deaths. Um, You see, sometimes in the Bible, a period of mourning or fasting was linked to a time of repentance, realizing something needed to change. It's exactly what Daniel was talking about. It's exactly what somebody's going to take a lead in, in those evening prayer meetings on the Wednesday and the Thursday before deeper. This time of re- just fasting and praying. And, and um, it, it, it's what we're doing in that time. Uh, setting apart those days because we, 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 we're wanting to fast and to seek God and to change. It's not just so that we can say we fast. We fast so that we can change. James Jesus' brother, you know, when he grew up with Jesus, James, you know, literally half-brother of Jesus, he, he, uh, he didn't believe who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God, that he was a Messiah. He didn't believe that until after the resurrection, after Jesus had been raised from the dead. Imagine that, growing up with Jesus, not realizing he's the Messiah, he's the chosen one. You don't realize it. There's an example of someone who had to repent. Someone who had to change his way of thinking and mourn the fact that he'd been like this. It was James who wrote the epistle, this James, same brother of Jesus, wrote the epistle of James, James, and he wrote in James 4, 9 to 10, he said, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. You see, James had got it. Mourning, mourning. If you want to be exalted, mourning precedes exaltation. That, that morning, I'm, I'm going to mourn, I'm going to weep, I'm going to cry because there's something not right in my life. I need to change it. God, the Holy Spirit, right now for some of you, I believe, is, is pointing out things in your life that you need to mourn about. Things that aren't right, perhaps bad habits, perhaps bad attitudes, perhaps lack of loving God, perhaps that lack of devoting yourself to reading his word and praying. And this isn't to condemn you. God, the Holy Spirit comes and says, come on, mourn about it so that I can exalt you because there's a comfort that God wants to pour out upon you. You see, this morning when you realize, hang on, I'm not totally aligned to the will of God. I'm not totally aligned to heaven. As you begin to realize there's something in your life and the Holy Spirit points out something in your life that needs to change, that morning has got comfort written all over it. Because you can mourn. You can mourn and say, God, I so regret this is still in my life after all these years. I mourn it. I mourn. I cry. I weep. And I want to change. And as you do that, so you receive comfort. The Holy Spirit, the person of God himself, God the Holy Spirit, is referred to in John's Gospel as the comforter. Humble yourself. And be prepared to say, I need to change my behavior. I need to change my way of thinking. And when you do that, you don't just receive comfort from God as though God has something like a big tub of ice cream in heaven. Here, get another scoop. You want one or two scoops of comfort? It isn't though he sends another dollop of comfort on you as though it's some thing that he sends to you. When God comforts you, he sends himself in the person of God the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Uh, 
Solomon in the Old Testament, he must have known something about this himself. And Solomon, especially towards the second half of his life, he, he knew it. But, but, he, but he wrote the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs 1.23, prophetically, listen to what he says. It's a wonderful verse. He, he says what wisdom in the person of Jesus promises. This is what's promised. If, Proverbs 1.23, if, if, if you turn, if you repent, if you change at my reproof, uh, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will turn out my spirit to you. You know, some area of your life right now where you're not aligned to the word of God, uh, more, because it's an opportunity for God the Holy Spirit to come and invade your life and to receive the presence of God the Holy Spirit. Not to condemn you, that would serve no useful purpose at all, but to come and fill you, to empower you, the comforter, to comfort you by empowering you as you live aligned to God to do and to live out the teaching of Jesus, to live out the word of God. Are we getting this this morning? Just two parts that we've looked at of this wonderful Sermon on the Mount. Just two parts. When you accept your poor in spirit and pride goes, yours is the kingdom. When you mourn your lack of compliance with God's word, you're not left alone. God gives God in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit rushes upon you and helps not just to hear the word of God, but to live out his word. You know, for people who live like that, here's something. They're not me, but Jesus promises. Blessed are you. It will go well with you. When? Uh, you, do, you want those things to go well with you? Listen to these words of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Can we just, just bow our heads and um, just maybe just close your eyes if you want to put your hand on your heart or something you can, but... I just want to pray on behalf of us all. And I'm going to pray um, in the first person, but I want you to pray. <laughs> Make this your prayer. And I'm just praying on behalf of us all. Lord, I hear your word today. I believe you've opened your mouth and spoken from the mountain. Your word has come from heaven. There's no way I can live on bread alone. I have to live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Without you, I'm totally bankrupt. I need you. I rely on you and not the favors of the rich and powerful in this world. I say today, I mourn my non-alignment with your word and say, calm Holy Spirit. Be to me, Holy Spirit, the comforter, the grace that empowers me to live out your word. I ask this in your name. Amen.